Thank you, Mark, and I will um, echo some of what Mark just said. Howard used to be the one who would do what Mark is doing now. Mark took his place about 10, 15 years ago, <clears throat> oh, probably 20 years ago. Um, but Howard would uh, give the announcements and introduce Dr. Johnson, and almost every Sunday he would say, at Believer's Chapel, we teach through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And that's what we do. We do that because the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's what divides between the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. It's what sanctifies us. It's really, in large part, what Believer's Chapel is about. has been from the day it was established in 1962 until the present. And if we are to be a viable church, that's what we will continue doing. And so that's what we're doing this morning. We are in 2 Timothy. We began a few weeks ago our series in 2 Timothy, and now we're in the second chapter, the first seven verses. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Well, may the Lord give us understanding of the things that we've read and bless our time of study together and make application to our hearts of it. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. You recognize that as the first sentence in Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, his novel about the French Revolution. Paul could have begun his last letter, 2 Timothy, with only that phrase, it was the worst of times. It was the twilight of his life, he was in prison, and the church was in retreat. Early in the letter he wrote, all who are in Asia turned away from me. At the end of the letter he reports that at his first trial before Caesar, no one supported me. It was a time of fear and unbelief. Was Paul discouraged? Maybe. But he wasn't defeated. He told Timothy, be strong. It's a message for our time. Paul would soon be dead, and he was telling Timothy to carry on the work. Now, Timothy, as we have Noticed in our previous studies in 1 Timothy and also in, in this series was maybe an unlikely choice for doing that. He was, we think, it seems, a, a timid and sickly young man. But Paul doesn't begin the passage by telling Timothy to dig deep within himself and find strength within. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The Christian life is lived from beginning to end by grace. It is designed that way. God's not given us a, a reserve of grace to draw upon when our own strength runs out. We begin and we end by God's sovereign grace alone. And there is always enough of it to do the tasks that we've been given. In fact, there's always more than enough so that we're to be faithful and to live by faith. Now that is how we do what Timothy was told to do. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We do what we are to do. 
We act in obedience, trusting God to provide for us with each step in life that we take. There's an illustration of that in the Old Testament that I find to be a very good picture of the Christian life. I've mentioned it before. I'll probably mention it again. It's in Joshua chapter 3. When Israel crossed the Jordan River and entered Canaan for the first time, the priests went first. But the river was overflowing its banks. It was at flood stage. It was impassable. Anyone who stepped into that torrent of water would be swept away to his or her death. But the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And God gave instruction, go forward. And at the Lord's command, the priests went forward. And the text says that when their feet dipped in the edge of the water, the river stopped and they walked over on dry ground. By faith, they stepped into a raging river. They risked everything by trusting in the Lord. And at that moment, as the sole of their foot touched the water, the river backed up. That's what God does for us as we walk by faith. His grace is greater than any obstacle we face, greater than any need that we have, and He is faithful always to provide for us when we are obedient to Him. Timothy was to understand that. He was to believe it. I think he understood that. I think he would have said yes to all of that, but did he really believe it or was he resting in that? That's what Paul wants him to do, to believe it and, and, and live obediently, trusting God. That's how we are to live. In fact, I'd say it is how we live. The command here is a present passive, and the passive voice has the sense of not what we do, but what's done for us or what's done to us. And the present has the sense of, of a continuing action. So what he's saying is keep on being in power. Don't stop. Or keep in touch with the power. This is what we're to do daily, moment by moment. And we do that, it seems to me, by reflection and prayer. Thinking about God and His greatness and His faithfulness. Thinking about passages like Joshua chapter 3. Remembering His promises, what He said, who He is, what His character is, how it's revealed, how we can trust Him for everything. Knowing God. That instills within us great confidence and courage. And then acting upon that, asking Him for the grace to do what we must do and living in light of that. that. That is the only way that we can successfully carry out the responsibilities that we have as Christians. It is in God's strength. For Timothy, the charge was to guard the gospel. For you, it may be to continue being a good parent or a faithful spouse in the home or be a witness in the office, at your work, doing it diligently, working honestly. Whatever the circumstance you are in, you have the responsibility to guard the gospel in word and deed. The two go together. And as we look to the Lord and we are in touch with Him, in touch with His power, we will be able to do it. Now, Timothy was to do that. He was to be active in guarding the gospel. But he was not only to guard the truth, he was also to pass it on. That is Paul's instruction in verse 2. In a faithless generation, he was to find faithful men. Paul writes, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If the apostasy, the faithlessness in the Asian churches made it necessary that Timothy guard the gospel, then the approaching death of Paul made it necessary that he hand it down to others. Timothy had been with Paul for many years. He had heard the gospel taught by its greatest teacher. He had something far better than a THM or a PhD. He had an apostolic education. 
He knew the gospel well. He knew the whole counsel of God as Paul had taught it. And he was to teach it to others. The instruction to entrust these things to faithful men brings out the importance of the truth that he was to protect and manage. What he was to entrust to others had been entrusted to him by Paul, and Paul had received it. It had been entrusted to him. He, he says that it was through the revelation of Jesus Christ that he knew these things. This was not Paul's invention. Now, you, you hear that today. I've read that from different critics of Christianity, and they've explained Christianity as basically being the invention of the Apostle Paul. It's a corruption of the teachings of Jesus and the, the first disciples. Paul came along and he changed everything up, that this gospel that we have is not the original teachings of Jesus. There's no grounds or truth for that, but that's the accusation that's made today, that this is his, his teaching. He's thought this up. But Paul faced that same accusation when he was an apostle, that he's not a genuine apostle or he's a second-rate apostle. This isn't really the gospel. So he has dealt with that himself. But he has stated that he received these things himself. What Timothy received, Paul had received and received it from the Lord. So what Paul is telling Timothy to pass on and guard is not his invention, it is revelation. It is divine revelation. And Timothy was to pass it on to faithful men who will be able to teach others. That is the divine pattern of things. The torch of orthodoxy is passed from generation to generation, from one generation to the next. That is the responsibility of the church. That's the responsibility of this church. Now it begins with the public ministry of the word with the teaching of Scripture. Not, not only in the pulpit, but in the Sunday school classes as well. We are to be a church that is very concerned for ourselves and our children, concerned about our knowledge of God's Word and our spiritual growth in the present, but also for the future. This should be happening in the church but it should also be happening in the home. Fathers should know the truth. It is incumbent that you understand the Word of God and the, the full counsel of God so that you can pass that on to your children and instruct them. Mothers as well should be teaching their children the Word of God and the doctrines of the, of the Word of God. Older women are to instruct younger women. We read that in Titus chapter 2, verse 4. And older men should give instruction and counsel to younger men. Friends should be admonishing and encouraging one another. Now that's what a real friend does. We know that from the Proverbs. Proverbs 27 verse 17. Iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. Friends do that. This was the charge that, that Paul gave to Timothy. The torch was being passed to him. And he, in turn, was to be busy passing it on to others. It is addressed to Timothy, but really it applies to all of us. A few years ago, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and it was Luther and the others who discovered, I should say rediscovered, that all Christians are priests. Now, that's really just the New Testament. That's, that's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where he says, we are a royal priesthood. What that means is we are all equipped to minister in some way by word or deed and that we should be doing that, exercising our priestly responsibilities. But this is especially true, I think, and I'm going to qualify this, but it's especially true of a minister of the gospel, one who has been called to, to teach God's people the word of God to the evangelist who's been called to preach the gospel so the rest of the chapter is, is a teaching in which Paul enlarges on Timothy's role in that. Not just for Timothy, though. We are all priests, and having said that, we all have this by application to us. But he will illustrate specifically to Timothy 
his great responsibility to do that, to guard the truth, to pass it on, to teach it clearly by six illustrations of it. The first is the soldier, the second is the athlete, then the farmer, the workman, a vessel, and finally a servant. Now, this morning we'll look at the first three. The soldier for his dedication, the athlete for his discipline, and the farmer for his hard work and reward. As a minister of the gospel, Timothy was to be a good soldier. Now that was a natural metaphor for Paul to choose. He spent many hours chained to a Roman soldier while a prisoner. He surely talked to them about their lives and listened as they told him about their training, their experiences on the battlefield, and saw similarities between a soldier's life and the Christian life. The soldier in active service did not live a comfortable life. He was always at risk, and he accepted the hardships and, and suffering as a matter of course. It's part of his life. He understood that. We're called to that kind of life. The Christian lives in a sphere of warfare. It is invisible. It is a spiritual warfare, but it is real and it is constant. In fact, you're in it right now. We're never not in it. There are always influences working against us that we don't see, maybe we don't feel. If it's not the, the demonic realm, it's the flesh. It's, it's what's within us or it's the world. It's all those that have this, this influence upon us. That's that's the, the life that we are in. That's our life. We are in the spiritual war. Paul told Timothy to be a good soldier. Not a soldier, but a good soldier. Some soldiers turn weak in the midst of battle and they, they run. They flee. They abandon the fight. A good soldier doesn't do that. A good soldier is courageous. And so, as a good soldier, Timothy was to accept the hardships and the dangers of the spiritual warfare and be obedient, like a, a soldier who was under orders. And we all are that. But again, that is especially true of a minister of the gospel. That is the, the first application here, since... He's writing specifically to Timothy. But again, it applies to all of us. But if Timothy, as a, a minister of the gospel, as a teacher, if he trims his message to please the crowd or passes over certain texts to avoid a hard doctrine, something that he might find difficult and know that he might get some pushback on, if he is trimming his message in any way, he's not a good soldier. When Paul was um, saying his final goodbye to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he said, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. I covered the whole range of doctrine with you, all of the word of God. Now that is our standard. That's what loyalty to Christ requires, that, that we teach God's people the truth and proclaim the good news to the lost, even though it is a narrow message of the one way and the one Savior. That's not a message that is appreciated in this day and age of pluralism that we live in. But then it's never been a message that was uh, received well by the world. So, it's going to be an unpopular message, but we must nevertheless preach it. We should consider, and I say consider the, the situation we're in when we do that. We should be considerate and thoughtful of others and, and, uh, and, and be tactful in the way we present our message. No doubt we need to do that, but nevertheless, at the same time, be clear and be firm and be willing to suffer the reproach of the world for the truth. And a congregation should settle for nothing less than that in the teaching that it receives. As I say, you're priests. 
You have the Spirit of God. You have the responsibility to sit with discernment and hear and listen to what is said and judge it and make the correct, correct decisions about things. And we should settle for nothing less than teaching the full truth of God. But a, a soldier not only had to be willing to suffer, he had to be ready to concentrate on his service and be detached from all other concerns. Paul states in verse 4, when a soldier goes on active service, he doesn't entangle himself in the affairs of everyday life. He, he doesn't get caught up in, in civilian life. That the things that are proper for some people were not proper for the soldier. He is to focus upon soldiering. Now that doesn't mean, to apply this more broadly to, to all of us, it doesn't mean that Christians aren't to be doing business in the world. Of course we are. That's where the battle is fought, in the office with our witness to colleagues or at home with our children. The, the fight largely in the Christian life is in the mundane. It's in the daily things of life, the day-to-day -day things of life. Paul told the Corinthians to lead a quiet life and work with your hands. That itself is a ministry. That's the Christian life. It's very basic. Be responsible. Do what you're supposed to be doing. Work, supply, uh, provide for your family, and if by God's grace you're able to, to have a surplus, use it to support and help others is what he's, he's saying. But be responsible people. That is the Christian life. That is a ministry because the world sees that. So this is the way we're to live our lives. This is, this is ministry. Uh, Paul is not suggesting that we don't uh, concern ourselves with employment. Paul himself em was employed, you or know. Uh, he at times worked as a tent maker to supply his own needs and, and those of his, of his colleagues. So he is all for employment, but the problem is entanglements that sometimes come from all kinds of things, all, what, all kinds of distractions that can, uh, can plague us in our Christian life. And it can be in business when we set uh, our, our ambitions too high and, and business becomes too, too controlling in our lives, or even hobbies and entertainment. Now, all of those things, and I could probably list others, are valid things, and they have their place. There's nothing wrong with, with entertainment or hobbies, but they can subtly gain a priority and distract us from our purpose, which is to live for Christ, to know Him, and be His witness. It takes wisdom. This is, this is where wisdom comes and discernment comes. A good soldier has as his goal not to satisfy himself, but to please his commander. And so too with the Christian. We want to please Christ, who is our captain, who enlisted us in his service, who purchased us with his own blood and, and called us out of darkness into light. As Paul told the, the, the Corinthians, Christ became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. And we have become rich with forgiveness, with his righteousness, with eternal life. And we could expand on that for the rest of the hour. We possess eternal life. What a blessing. We are the richest people on this earth. Now we have opportunity to serve him because of that. Because he's called us out of darkness into light, he's called us out of the world into his family, we have the opportunity to serve him in gratitude for what he's done. But doing that well requires avoiding distractions in order to use well the gifts we have and to use well the brief time that we have on this earth. Ah, oh, but there are lots of attractive distractions, aren't there? Yes, I, there are. We all feel that. We're all drawn to them. They have a, a kind of... A, ineluctable, irresistible power about them. So, um, 
it's not enough often to, be, to simply exhort. I can exhort you and you can exhort me and I can exhort myself to, to not be entangled in the things of this life and be more dedicated to the Lord. But the reality is those things are strong and what we really need is strength from heaven. We need the strength of the Lord. This is what Paul is talking about in the first verse. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That is our strength. His life, not our own. Spurgeon told of the Duke of Wellington in one of his great battles, ordering one of his officers to advance with his troops and occupy a gap that he saw in the French lines. Before marching, the officer rode, uh, rode up to the Duke and he said, My Lord, I will do the work, but first give me a grasp of that conquering right hand of yours. And he got the handshake that he asked for and then he rode off into battle. It is only as we lay hold of Christ, Spurgeon was explaining, grab his hand, so to speak, that we are able to go forward into battle and do our work. But we, we not only seek a handshake, we are to hold on and not let loose of the Lord's conquering right hand because He goes with us into battle. And we always need to be in connection with Him. And really, that's what will make us good soldiers. His power and the knowledge that Christ is with us and and in every stage and in every step we take. That gives courage to be loyal and obedient. The author of Hebrews in, in chapter 2 verse 10 calls Jesus the author of our salvation. Uh, the founder of our salvation. It's an interesting word because it has a variety of meanings. Author or captain, leader, so he is the captain of our salvation, and he is bringing many sons to glory. He is leading us to our heavenly rest. And the picture you get is of him leading us through this world, leading us to that glorious end, step by step, at every moment. Well, knowledge of that encourages us, it motivates us to obey. That is a captain that we want to please. He never sends us where he himself has not gone. We never go anywhere that he is not with us. And our goal in life should be to know and please him. Service is a duty, it is true. But it should be a delightful duty. Seeing who it is that we serve. It will be as we increasingly come to know Him. And that's essential. Fellowship with Christ is the strength of the church. It's not in our eloquence. It's not in political power. It is fellowship with Christ, which comes through study and prayer. I mentioned Wellington. He is reported to have said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Well, in verse 5, Paul moves from the battlefield to the playing field. And the, the strict training of the athlete, which does prepare a person for soldiering. Uh, this is an illustration that would have, uh, uh, have resonated as much in Paul's day as it does in ours. Men have always been sports enthusiasts. The Greeks had the Pan-Hellenic Games, the most famous of them being the Olympic Games, uh, practiced every four years. The Romans were more into blood sport, but just as fervent about their contests. In the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon wrote uh, how fans would gather in the stadium before dawn to wait for the event. Uh, the happiness of Rome, he wrote, appeared to hang on the event of a race. So Paul drew upon this um, very familiar figure of an athlete 
to illustrate the discipline necessary for the Christian life and ministry. He reminded Timothy, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. An athlete in the Olympic Games had to be honest, not, not only in the way that he ran the race and observing the rules of the race and staying within his, the, the lane and the lines and all of that, but also had to be honest about preparation for the race because there were strict rules that governed even his training. And that was to ensure the high standard of the games. And so athletes had to make an oath before a statue of Zeus that they had fulfilled the required 10 months of training before they were eligible to compete. So from the beginning to the end, the athlete had to be highly disciplined. And it's the same for the Christian life. It requires discipline. Following the principles of conduct given in the Bible. Paul writes of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He writes of self-control, about running and boxing, and says, I discipline my body and make it my slave. Now that's the Christian life. Now it, it is strength that we draw from God's grace that is in Christ Jesus, but that strength translates into a disciplined life and a life of effort and energy. Ancient athletes did that in order to win a wreath made of uh, wild celery or evergreen, something that perished very quickly. We strive for eternal glory. What, what Paul will later speak of as the crown of righteousness. Now that is well worth bodily discipline. It is worth self-denial and hard work. Pleasing Christ with an honest life makes discipline well worth it. Pleasing Christ is reward enough if we truly understand who He is and what He's done for us. But still, there are rewards in the Christian life that result from discipline, that result from sacrifice and hard work. And Paul illustrates that in verse 6 from the, the toil of the farmer and his reward. The hard-working farmer ought to be first to receive his share of the crops. Paul traveled throughout the ancient world. He saw Roman soldiers. He saw stadiums and gymnasiums. He saw farms and farmers working in their fields, sowing and reaping. And he probably talked to many of those farmers in the marketplaces of the ancient cities that he visited. He, he knew how hard the work was and how dull it could be. The f farmer didn't have the excitement of the soldier or the applause of the athlete. His routine was mundane and difficult. Every day he had to rise early and toil, struggle against hard soil which needed to be plowed and continually cleared of brush and thorns. Farming is not a life for the lazy or the restless. But it had its reward. The hard-working farmer receives the fruit of the harvest. And so does the diligent Christian. Like the farmer who is the first to receive his share of the crop, the Christian receives his share of the spiritual harvest. The person who applies himself or herself to spiritual pursuits will, will reap the rewards of his or her life. Now Paul doesn't tell us what those fruits are. He doesn't tell us what we will reap, but you can uh, think about it and, it, and it's some of it's very obvious. Wisdom, for one. As we study and as we live an obedient life, we learn the Christian life and we experience it to the full and we gain the wisdom that is in the Word of God and become wise and helpful people. It doesn't come through neglect, but through discipline, by striving and personal effort. Bishop Ryle wrote, I will never sink, rather, I will never shrink from declaring my belief that there are no spiritual gains without pains. And that's true. That's true. There is also, though, reward from 
not only the personal things that we gain, the personal maturity that increases to us as we apply ourselves, but there's the reward of converts, of, of winning souls and building them up in the faith, of, of strengthening the church. It's what Paul did, and no one worked harder at that than the Apostle Paul, and no one suffered for it more than the Apostle Paul. Dr. J.H. Jowett said, I once saw the track of a bleeding hare across the snow. That was Paul's track across Europe. And that is what Paul was asking Timothy to do, to join him in that, to bleed with him in the service of Christ. Suffer hardship with me, he says. Now, how could he ask Timothy to do that? How could he ask Timothy to suffer? That's a hard thing to ask someone to do. I've never asked anybody, come suffer with me. So I haven't suffered that much, to be quite honest. That'd be a hard thing to ask. This was a critical time. Men were defect, uh, defecting from the truth and from the gospel, and Timothy was becoming shy about it, receding himself, sitting on the sideline, and Paul says, don't do that, Timothy. He's saying, suffer with me. Suffer hardship with me. And he could do that because he, he knew it was well worth it. There's no greater cause in all of life than serving Christ and the church. It has eternal reward. There is no greater blessing than doing that. I have to say, as, as I was going over my notes and thinking about this, and I came to that point where Paul is saying, suffer hardship with me, I thought, is that my life? I can preach it to you. It's what Paul says here, and I'm going to be, if I'm going to be faithful to the Word of God, I'm going to tell you what he says, and, and that's what really is the exhortation to us, but do I really do that? And I, I have to say, I don't know. The, the tests of life bring these things out, and when that test comes, we'll know. We, I mentioned Luther earlier, we sing his hymn, Let Goods and uh, the Mighty Fortress, and that line in his hymn, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. And I believe that. And I think you believe that. But are you ready to let everything go, even your life? Well, I'm being honest, I don't know how, I, I don't know about that myself sometimes. But here's what I do know. I know the way to that kind of devotion. I know how to get there. And it is by knowing God's Word. It's by seeing Christ in the Word of God, learning who He is, and knowing Him more and more personally. And as that is known, it affects us. It changes us. It be, it, it, we have this closer, gen, more genuine relationship with Him, and then we are ready to do things that we ordinarily cannot do. And of course, when we do them, we do it only in the grace of God that He supplies. But it's through this, for our standpoint, a dedication to the Word of God, to studying it and knowing it. And that's really what comes next at the end of our passage. Paul is saying to, to, to Timothy, times are hard, Timothy, and the, the church is drifting, but don't quit. Be strong, join with me in this ministry, consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And that's how He does give us understanding in everything. It's as we consider what Paul has said. It's as we consider the revelation that is given to us in this book. It's as we think about what the apostles have written that God enlightens us. It's through His Word. And so as Timothy would consider the importance of Christian service, of the Christian life, consider God's grace and His faithfulness to provide, he would know the truth of it. He would be encouraged. He would be strengthened. He would be made strong. This was written for Timothy in a dark time. What might have seemed to Paul the worst of times for his ministry, but it's for us too. We live in the best of times and the worst of times. 
we live in a time of unparalleled material prosperity. And we live in a time of spiritual darkness, a time of ignorance and unbelief and indifference. These are challenging times, faithless days that call for God's people to be strong in faith. Faith comes from hearing, Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Do you want strong faith? Do you want your faith to increase? Then the formula is very simple. Faith comes from hearing. Hear the Word of God. Hear it preached, hear it taught, hear it in, in your mind as you read it and as you ponder it and as you reflect upon it. Hear it as the Spirit of God teaches it to you. Then you'll be built up in the faith and you'll become strong and mature. So we need to hear, we need to consider God's Word. And as we do that, seriously consider His revelation, we will be taught His counsel of grace and power, taught our unworthiness. We, re we, we are taught that on almost every page of Scripture as we reflect that we are unworthy. And yet we have His great gift of everlasting life. Think of that. The unworthy, those who cannot add anything to what Christ has done, who are debtors to mercy alone, have everything because of what He did. We have life everlasting because of what He has done. Now that should motivate us. I began with the first sentence of Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities. It ends with a scene of sacrifice when the hero, Sidney Carton, goes to his death in place of another. Sidney was a young Englishman, a brilliant lawyer who had led a wasted life. But he goes to France, he enters the Bastille, and secretly changes places with a prisoner, Charles Darnay. Charles had been falsely accused of treason. He had also married the woman who was the love of Sidney's life. And for her sake, Sidney saved her husband. As he mounts the scaffold to the guillotine, his final words are, it is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Dickens quotes Christ. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The words of Sidney Carton are fiction. The words of Christ are fact. And true for all believers because he died as our substitute, not for the falsely accused, but for the truly guilty. Paul told Timothy, consider what I say. He would tell us, consider what Christ said and what He did. He took your place on the scaffold. He went to your death, suffered your hell, so that you could have His life and His heaven. Now I think, that it is only as we understand that, and to the degree that we understand it, that we will be strong, and we will want to know Him, and gladly sacrifice for Him and His people. Paul invited Timothy to join him in suffering for the gospel. It's only as we know the greatness of grace and the wonder of Christ's sacrifice that we will do that and serve the Savior. May God give us more grace and more understanding and more faith so that we will serve Him faithfully, fearlessly in these worst of times. These are also times of opportunity and times that are brief and times that will soon end and we will soon be with the Lord to a better rest than we have ever known. Life is a vapor. And for those without Christ, that should be a concern. Because the end is soon coming, and there is no rest for you, only eternal night and separation from everything that is good. There's a way of escape. It's through Christ, 
It's through the substitute. Come to Him. Believe in Him. Join yourself to His sacrifice and receive forgiveness and life everlasting. And then join the battle, as Paul was telling Timothy to do. Well, may God help all of us to do that. And reflect deeply upon what He's done for us. Reflect on His grace. So That's a good way to end. Let's stand and sing Amazing Grace, hymn number 227, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 227. <clears throat> Father, it's true, we will spend all eternity singing about Your grace being amazed by it. There'll be no end to that. We thank You for it. We could be saved in no other way but as a gift from You by Your sovereign grace. We thank You for that and the gift of life in Your Son. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Warren.